भद्रम कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येमाजत्रा स्थिरंगयीसुष्टवागु सस्तनु व्यशेम देवित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्व स्वस्ति नाक्षो अरिष्टने स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शाति 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 ओम ओ वेदिक गॉड्स मे वी हियर ऑस्पिशियस वर्ड्स विद आवर इयर्स वाइल एंगेज इन सैक्रिफाइसिस मे वी सी ऑस्पिशियस थिंग्स विद द आईज वाइल प्रेजिंग द गॉड्स विद स्टडी लिम्स मे वी एंजॉय अ लाइफ दैट इज बेनिफिशियल टू द गॉड्स May Indra of ancient fame be auspicious to us. May the all-knowing Pusha, God of the earth, be propitious to us. May Garuda, the destroyer of evil, be well disposed towards us. May Brihaspati ensure our welfare. Om, peace, peace, peace. So you have started the Mundaka Upanishad, and uh, I'll just first chant the. Uh, mantras which we have already done and um, then i'll i'll summarize in brief what what they contain i'll just translate basically first a chant om brahma deva nam prathama sambhuva vishvasya karta bhuvanasya gopta sa brahma vidyam sarva vidya pratishtham atharvaya jeshta putraya prah अथर्वणेयां प्रवदेत ब्रह्मा अथर्वाता पुरोवाचा गिरे ब्रह्म विद्या स भारद्वाजा सत्यवहाय प्राह भारद्वाज अंगिसे परावरा शौनको हई महाशालो अंगिस विधिवदुपसंद पृछ कस्ू भगवो विज्ञाते भवतीति तस्मै सहो वाच द्वे विद्ये वेदितव्ये इति अस्मयद ब्रह्म विदो वदंती परा चरा चापराग्भेद यजुर्वेद साम वेद अथर्व वेद शिक्षा कल्प व्याकरण निरुक्त छंदो ज्योतिषमी अत परायया तदक्षरमगम्य तदेश्यमग्राह्यमगोत्रवर्णम अचक्षुश्रोत्र तद पाणीपाद निभु सर्वगत सुसूक्ष्म तद्व्यय यदूत पिपश्य to a an ancient lineage of knowledge coming down from um god himself down to a, through a series of teachers and students and then we have our uh, you know we're coming to the teacher and student who is going to talk about this upanishad shaunaka turns up he's the student and the teacher is angiras and he comes the student is well equipped you know later there will be discussion about the qualifications of the student we know while studying vedanta the student has to have um, viveka discrimination vairagya dispassion the sixfold treasures that means the disciplines of the mind and the senses um, and then mumukshutva an intense desire for freedom so a well qualified student has turned up um, and asks a question and the quest- form of the question is very interesting कस्मो भगवो विज्ञाते सर्वदम विज्ञात भवती सर वाट इज दैट बै नोइंग दट वन थिंग एवरीथिंग बिकम्स नोन सो टीच मी दैट थिंग बै नोइंग विच आई कैन नो एवरीथिंग बै वन नॉलेज ऑल नॉलेज इज एक्वायर्ड सो वॉट इज दैट एंड बिफोर आंसरिंग दैट वी मस्ट अंडरस्टैंड द डेप्थ ऑफ द क्वेश्चन वॉट ही इज एस्किंग इज that um, you know in causation cause and effect when a thing is made out of something else um that the material out of which a thing is made is called the material cause in sanskrit upadana uh, karana 
So if you make a lot of furniture out of wood, wood is your material cause. And the furniture is the effect, the product. If you make a lot of uh, ornaments out of gold, gold is the material cause. And the ornaments are the product. Now, by knowing the material cause, one can know all the products or all the effects. I'll repeat that. By knowing the, what the material cause is, one knows all the effects. How? In what sense? Well, if you realize that all golden ornaments are made of gold, all golden ornaments are made of gold, um, um, and you know what gold is, then it, in that sense, you know the reality of all these uh, ornaments. Uh, you know that all these ornaments are nothing but gold. They're different names, forms, and functions imposed on gold. Um, you see a variety of furniture. But if you know wood, what wood is, then you know that all of this, all of this furniture is basically this material called wood. Uh, so in that sense, you know the reality of everything. At this point, one might say that, yeah, I mean, I might know that all golden ornaments, whatever it is, even without seeing, as long as you tell me it's made of gold, I'll know what it is. However, I won't know the details. Like, I won't know what it looks like, what the particular design is. That can differ. Yes. But here we are asking a very fundamental question. In reality, what is it? The names and forms and functions may infinitely differ. But all of it is, all the ornaments are nothing but gold. All the waves in the water are nothing but water and so on. All the pottery is nothing but clay. If you know the cause, you know the effect in reality, what it really is. So what this question is asking is, we are seeing this tremendous universe before us. What extraordinary variety. Living, non-living. Um, from the tiniest of bacteria or viruses to the most massive of galaxies. Um, and uh, from um, you know, living beings, such tremendous variety, uh, non-living things. And that's just the physical universe. Then there's a mental universe. All of us, all intelligent beings, we all have minds. Such a variety of knowledge, uh, emotion, sentiment, creativity. This vast, subtle inner universe. All of this diversity. If it is true that there is one underlying reality from which all of this has come, then if we could know that one reality from which the many has come, we would know everything. Let me repeat that. If we know the material cause of the universe, then we know what the, and we know everything in the universe in that special sense which I mentioned. You know the reality of everything. You know the answer is going to be that yes, there is such a thing. It's Brahman. And if you know Brahman, you know everything in the universe. That one thing by which you know everything. But you know everything in what sense? You know everything in the universe. An enlightened one knows everything in the universe. He knows that it is Brahman. So that knowledge. And it's, it's tremendously useful. So after this knowledge, you go on living your life. Whoever you come across, you know it is the same Brahman which you are. You are all of that. All of those people. Whatever you come across in life, good and bad. You know it's not really good and bad. It's, it's Brahman, it's what you are. Whatever situation you are in, whatever physical health or illness is there, whatever kind of person you come across, or if there is no person you come across at all, in every case, that one shining reality, it's available to you. You can see it. You can see it means you know it. So it's a great, I mean, it sets you free actually. You see the sameness everywhere. You see the underlying truth of this universe. Um, so this is the great question which the student has asked the teacher. Now, the teacher, instead of directly telling him it's Brahman, he says, he says to the student, You asked me a question, that knowledge by which all knowledge is attained. But let me tell you, knowledge is of two kinds, the higher and the lower, para and apara, because you are asking me a special question. Uh, that's why I'm telling you that knowledge itself is of two kinds, because you are asking about the knowledge, uh, the special kind of knowledge. What is this higher and lower knowledge? In our language, which we're talking about cause and effect, material cause and effect or product. If you want to know the effect severally, separately, then that's the lower knowledge. 
you can have chemistry and physics and biology and physiology and art and um, you know music and sculpture and language it's multiple languages and grammars what not these are all varieties of the effects what you find in the universe what we experience in the universe if you want to pick, pick, pick them up one by one and study them that's the knowledge of the effect and that's all of that knowledge entirety is classified under lower knowledge it's put under lower knowledge why is it put under lower knowledge because the student is asking a specific a very deep question so you, from the very beginning the teacher wants to isolate this question from every other worldly question um the higher knowledge compared to all of this higher knowledge is uh, the knowledge which will show you the reality of all these effects not in detail but in basically what it is that's the what that's what you're asking for so you're not asking for one more branch of science you're not asking for one more branch of humanities no 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 you're asking the most fundamental question what is all this that's what you're asking i'm going to tell you that that's a separate knowledge so that higher knowledge in our in our terms it's the knowledge of the cause the knowledge of the material cause of um, brahman the underlying one underlying cause of this entire universe um here uh, that cute story i told you last time about uh, ganesha and uh, kartika so kartika went on his peacock and he flew around the universe it's in in order to go around the universe he flew around the lit he so when his mother gave him that competition between ganesha and kartika kartika took it literally so to know everything how do you know everything you have to know everything to fly around, fly around the universe go around the universe how do you do that you literally go around the universe just start and then go around the entire universe and come back so that's what he did what ganesha did was to know everything means to know what it really is one thing only to know everything means really to know one thing to go around the universe means to go around shiva and parvati his mother and father so he went around circumambulated three times his father and uh, mother uh, shiva the great god the divine mother so now this question which shonaka has asked belongs to that second category the, the what what ganesha did that uh, the underlying one reality the one underlying the many before we go on and yes and then um, the teacher gives a whole list an example tell me what do you mean by lower knowledge and he gives the entire list the, the four vedas rigveda yajurveda samaveda atharva veda and all the auxiliaries the six things we need to know to study the vedas which is shiksha kalpa vyakarana nirukta chanda jyotisha i'm not explaining all this we did it all last time so this is the lower knowledge and today we would include all kinds of secular knowledge everything whatever you find in the world Uh, knowledge in detail knowledge in detail and that has a value that's how the world works you need knowledge in detail for to work in the world but for freedom enlightenment you need the knowledge of the one what it really is um before we go into the actual answer what is the knowledge of that one um i was thinking isn't this the question which um, cosmologists or physicists are asking in theoretical physics what is that one thing by knowing which everything is known they call it grand unified theory gut or theory of everything toe uh, so it's the question which we scientists are asking actually today ultimately one principle to unify all our knowledge of the universe at least in physics to unify it and that will so so is it the same question not quite it's it's a subset of the same question i would say what shonok is asking is even more grand see even if you um, underline um, if you uh, if you find out the underlying principle of the entire cosmos uh, you will unify the physical cosmos but really you have not unified you have not understood what the mental cosmos is i mean what's a thought uh, what's an emotion what's an idea unless you solve the hard problem of consciousness and show literally thoughts emotions ideas are nothing but electrical activity in the brain and brain is nothing but matter and matter is explained by our grand unified theory if you cannot do that then there is something that you have not been able to explain that is thoughts emotions ideas that remains a separate realm 
And according to Advaita Vedanta, consciousness is yet another, even vaster, much more profound realm than the mental. That is not at all explained by the grand unified theory or whenever we come to it. I mentioned one monk was asked this. The scientists are in this quest for a unity, unifying principle for everything. So wouldn't that be non-duality? And he said in Hindi, That will be a non-duality of the insentient universe, the objective universe. But that's not all of it. That's not one thing by which, but by knowing that, you still wouldn't be able to explain sentient beings. You still wouldn't be able to explain mind and consciousness. So that's left out. Um, all right, so that's just my observation. Uh, not that this pursuit is not useful. It's, it's definitely useful. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it is the quest for truth in our times, the quest for unifying all the theories of physics, most fundamental uh, theories of physics. All right. Now let's go into the sixth mantra, which we which we were looking at last time. So what is the translation? I did it last time. Let me just read it out once more. So what is this higher knowledge? Finally, he's able to give the answer. And it's nice that he gets directly to the answer. Yeah, you know, in the Kata Upanishad, we have to wait a long time for the teaching to start. Here he answers it directly. By the higher knowledge, the wise realize everywhere that which cannot be perceived and grasped, which is without source, features, eyes and ears, which has neither hands nor feet, which is eternal, multiformed, all-pervasive, extremely subtle and undiminishing, and which is the source of all. Okay. Very important um, mantra, because this constitutes the direct answer to Shonaka's question. In order to grasp it and realize it, we need the rest of the Upanishad. But a straight answer to the question, a straight question, a straight answer is here. Then we'll look deeper into it. But first, what did he say? So that akshara, because the last mantra said, the higher knowledge is by which the akshara is grasped. Akshara means the undiminishing, undecaying, imperishable. Basically, he means Brahman, the ultimate reality. So that one, it is uh, adrishyam. Adrishyam is another word for drishyam, adrishyam, which means um, invisible. So it's not something that has a form. It cannot be seen by the eyes. And by extension, it cannot be seen uh, it cannot be heard, smelt, tasted, touched. It's not an object for the five senses. So it's invisible to the five senses. All right, fine. But there is a deeper meaning which Shankaracharya brings out in his commentary. He says, Drish, Adrishyam here means not an object for the reflected consciousness. See, in, there's a lot of Vedantic epistemology here. How do we know anything at all? How do we know anything at all? You are pure consciousness. And then that is reflected in the, in the mind, in the subtle body. That's called reflected consciousness. And then the rest of it is the mind and the senses and the external world. All of these interact and the information comes in the mind. And that is lit up by the reflected consciousness. And that's how we know. So I see this pen. What is happening? Light is reflected from the pen. Goes into my, uh, the light goes into my eyes. And then an image is formed that is somehow changed into electrical impulses which race along the optic nerves to a certain brain center. From there, what happens? Nobody knows. So from there, that information is somehow presented uh, to the mind. Now we are talking psychological language, no longer brain science. It presented to the mind. Uh, and uh, what we call, there is a movement in the mind, vritti. And the movement takes the form of a pen. Not a real pen. It's just... Uh, a mental pen, let us say, a mental facsimile or copy or representation of the pen. And that is lit up by the consciousness reflected in the mind. Then we know, then I have the knowledge, I am seeing a pen. So pen akara vritti, the mental modification in the form of the pen is lit up by reflected consciousness, chidabhasa, and that's knowledge according to Advaita Vedanta. Uh, I, yeah, according to the Vedanta, Sankhya also. 
Um, now what Shankaracharya is saying, you can't know the imperishable Brahman in that way. There's never going to be some sensory input about Brahman and then it goes to the mind and then the reflected consciousness lights it up and it says, ah, that's, I am now seeing Brahman. No, that's not going to happen. It is not an object for reflected consciousness. So it's a very deep point he's making here. Agraham, nor is it an object for the motor organs. So it's not an object. Brahman, the ultimate reality, is not an object for the senses, for the mind, for reflected consciousness, nor is it something that you can attain through your um, motor, what is the motor, motor organs? Hands and feet and, um, you know, the power of speech. So you can't walk to Brahman. Can I go on a pilgrimage to Brahman? No. Can I catch hold of Brahman? You know, we always say, catch hold of the lotus feet of the Lord. So can I catch hold of the lotus feet of Brahman? No, you can't. First of all, it's not an object you can catch hold of. And second, he will say, Brahman doesn't have any feet. He's going to <laughs> tell us that. So anyway, um, it's not an object of any action. You cannot do anything to attain Brahman. That's another thing. And then all of this becomes pretty easy to understand if you consider um, consciousness itself. Uh, or look at it this way. Let me give you an intermediate example which will help us to understand the whole thing quite easily. Consider the dream example. So when we are in our dreams, we know everything in the dreams is just our mind. When you wake up, you realize it was the mind in its own place which dreamt up the entire dream universe and the person in the dream too. Now if I ask you, that mind you know, you're walking around in the dream, you can see things, you can hear things, and you know, things are just going on fine. When someone explains to you that it's all mind, can you see that mind in the dream? No, you cannot. It's not an object. You can see trees and people and things in a dream, you know, all sorts of fantastic things you can see in a dream, which you cannot see in the waking world. But you can never see the mind, which is the constituent of the, which is the basic, basic reality of the dream. So it cannot be seen, heard, smelled, tasted, touched. It's not an object in the dream. Then can you attain it by some action? Can you walk around in the dream and uh, in one particular place in the dream world, there'll be the mind? <laughs> of course not. If someone tells you everything here is made of the mind, can you dig in the ground in the dream and find out the mind, excavate it? No. So it's not an object you can attain by any action. Similarly, pure consciousness, Atman or Brahman in this world of experience, is not an object. So the dream example is very nice to understand this. It cannot be an objectified by senses, mind, speech, so neither an object of knowledge nor an object of action. This is what has been said. Then Agotram, it is without any source. So everything in the universe has a source. As I said, material cause and then the effect. Some gold, ornaments, water, waves, clay, pot, so Brahman and the universe, we are saying that. But then what is the material cause of Brahman, if you ask? Does it have a source? Does it have a material cause? Uh, does it have a karana? No, it has no, no source. Uh, it, it has no material cause. It is the reality out of which everything else appears. Um, then Agotram, Avarnam. Literally the word Varna means color. It also means caste, you know. Um, but here... And the third meaning of Varna will be uh, properties, qualities. So here only the philo philosophical meaning that the qualities is, is uh, meant here. So Avarna means Brahman, the ultimate reality, has no qualities. Nirguna. Uh, it, is, it is beyond all qualities. Then Achakshu Shrotram, Tadapani Padam. It does not have sense organs. So it, it has, doesn't have eyes and ears and Brahman, the pure consciousness, does not have sense organs. Again, very easy to understand in the dream world. See, it sees without eyes. It hears without uh, ears. In the dream world, we get the feeling of seeing things. We get the feeling of uh, hearing things. But our actual physical eyes and ears are not functioning there. Your eyes are closed. You're sleeping. So you're not hearing or seeing anything. And yet the mind experiences everything in the dream world. It seems to be that we are seeing, hearing, but it's actually all the play of the mind. Similarly, Advaita is making the claim that ultimately pure consciousness alone is the one which generates all experiences. And that it does without any kind of 
eyes or ears or sense organs or mind also. Those are at our level, but really it is consciousness alone which uh, illumines everything. And the deeper meaning here is, it is not uh, a knower in that sense. See, if I have eyes, ears, nose, if uh, I have mind to think, then I am a knower. I see, I hear, I smell, I taste, because I have eyes, ears, nose, skin, tongue. I have mind to think, so I am a thinker. But if I'm con by con consciousness, the imperishable Brahman is not a knower or thinker in that sense. It is just consciousness by itself. It is not an agent of knowledge. And then Tadapani Padam doesn't have hands and feet. By that, what it means is Brahman is not an agent of action. It's not a doer. It's not a doer. Therefore, no action produces and no, no, no result of action will come to it. It's free from action, free from cause and effect. And uh, these are very philosophically profound points because in the Hindu, Buddhist, um, Jain, the Indian worldview, our bondage is due to karma. We are doers of action, good and bad, and therefore we are the enjoyers or sufferers of the consequences of action. But Brahman, because it's not a doer, it doesn't have any, any of the instruments of doing anything. It's just light awareness. So it is not the doer of any actions and therefore not the enjoyer or sufferer of any consequences. It is beyond karma. Again, the dream example. Everything is happening in the dream. But the dreaming mind, does it have hands? So you are walking around in the dream. But you know that you and the road you are walking on and the place you are going to in the dream, it's all mind. Mind has generated it. So walking is going on. But does the mind have feet to walk with? Does the mind have hands to um, grasp a cup of coffee in the dream? Nothing. And yet all action is going on. The mind itself does not have hands and feet. It's not itself doing any action there. Then nityam vibhum sarva gatam susukshmam. Some, all of these are negative till now. Now some positive ascriptions are being given. Nityam. It is eternal. Eternal means uh, imperishable. That was the word which was used. Akshara. Imperishable. Akshara. Um, so in what sense? You take the examples again. The cause and the effect. The effects are perishable. The cause continues. Think about the gold and the ornaments. So it is a lump of gold. And the um, skilled jeweler made a bracelet out of it. Uh, or made a necklace out of it. So before it was a, a necklace, it was gold. And after the necklace was made, it is gold. And one day when the necklace is melted and made into another uh, ornament, maybe a bracelet, it is still gold. Notice, the necklace came and went. The necklace was born or produced. It stayed for some time and then it went back again. It disappeared. Disappeared in what? Where was it born from? Gold. Where did it exist? Gold. Where did it disappear back to? It means what remained afterwards? Gold. But all throughout, before the necklace, during the necklace, and after the necklace, gold persisted. And when the necklace that was made, that same gold was made into a bracelet, gold persisted. So the effects are um, shara or perishable. All the effects, all the products. So for Brahman, all the worlds, all human beings and non-human beings, all the living bodies, they all are born and exist and die including the worlds which we inhabit. Worlds are also born. They exist and die. Tagore in one poem is very evocative. He says, the same leaf which falls from the tree into the lake and sets out ripples on the lake. So imagine a dry leaf falls from a branch of a tree and falls in a lake and sets out some gentle ripples when it falls. And Tagore says, the same ripples run through the stars of the cosmos. This is the same ripples of change and decay and death. You know, there are the mighty stars and one leaf falling from the tree. It is the same process going on. They are all effects, including our bodies. They all run down and die. Mm -hmm. So, but Brahman continues. Our real nature, Atman, another name, Akshara. That's why it is called Nitya, uh, eternal, imperishable. Among all perishable effects, the cause remains the same. Gold in all the ornaments, they come and go. But uh, gold remains. 
In all the clay pot, clay remains. In all the waves which come and rise and fall, water remains water. So in that sense, Brahman remains as Brahman no matter what happens in our lives, in the universe. Everything, it comes and goes like the rising and falling of waves. But Brahman is eternal. Vibhum. Vividam bhavati iti vibhum. That means it appears diversely. It's an interesting thing. One uniform existence consciousness bliss. And yet it appears as human beings and animals and plants. It appears as stars and quasars. It appears as uh, um, ducks and geese. and It appears as good and bad. It appears as the worlds and tiny particles. So vividam bhavati. The same Brahman appears diversely. Dream example. See, the mind in the dream, you see the tremendous variety. Just the mind by itself generates a tremendous variety. And so many fantastical things in the dream which you don't find in the waking world. Sarvagatam, all pervasive. So the effect is always pervasive in the uh, cause is always pervasive in the effect. Um, in all the pots made of clay, what will you find? Pots are all different. Different shape, shape, different size, different name. One is called a pot. One is called a jar. One is called whatever. Uh, but what is there? Clay. The cause, clay, pervades. That means it's present through and through in all the effects. Gold. You make ornaments out of it. Same gold. Variety of ornaments. Not only variety. In all that variety, one thing is present. Gold. So sarvagatam, all pervasive. Uh, a cause pervades the effect. Therefore, Brahman pervades the universe. Everything that you experience is nothing in this universe outside of Brahman. So everything you experience, whatever you experience, whoever you experience, and your own self, all of that is nothing but Brahman. Brahman, Bra Brahman pervades it. That's why Vivekananda said, never approach anything except as God. What a beautiful statement. Because cause pervades the effect. Imperishable Brahman pervades the cosmos, the perishable cosmos. Therefore, whomever you are approaching, whatever you are approaching, never approach anything except as God. It's the highest truth. Tadabhyayam, the undecaying, the undecaying. Everything is decaying. All are aging, changing and dying. Death is inevitable. Vivekananda says that um, uh, fools die, the learned die, paupers die and emperors die, and sinners die and sages die. So death is all pervasive. And yet it says here, Tadabhyayam, the undying, undecaying. And that's you. You do not die. You are that Brahman. And so is everybody else. So in that sense, there's no death. A gold necklace may be fashioned, may stay for some time. The jeweler may melt it down. Gold was there before it became a necklace. When it became a necklace, it was gold. During the time of being a necklace, it was gold. And when it was melted down, it was gold. When it's again a lump of gold, it's still gold. It is undecaying. And it does not get reduced. No matter how many times you make variety of ornaments from it, the same gold remains. It's not diminished if you make lots of uh, ornaments out of it. Um, so, yeah. Yad bhuta yo, then, yad bhuta yonim paripashyanti dhira. Yad bhuta yonim. Uh, yonim here means the source, the place of production, the, the cause which re leads to the effect. This is the most important term. This is the key term, which is the answer to the question. Tell me one thing by knowing which I can know everything. So, by knowing the cause, you can know the effect. Here he's saying that this imperishable is the cause. It is the cause of all, all beings. Living, non-living, the entire universe. Bhuta. All entities arise from this. As gold is the um, source for all ornaments. Material source. Water is the material source for all waves. Similarly, Brahman, the imperishable is the source for all perishable entities of this universe. Living, non-living, vast, tiny, uh, momentary, or persisting for eons. All of that is the source is Brahman. Therefore, it is the answer to your question, O Shaunaka. You ask me for one thing by knowing which I can know everything. Well, you have to know the cause if you want to know all the effects. And here is the cause, which I just mentioned. Okay. 
that's a lot but then how would i know this i know what gold is i and i understand when you say gold and ornaments i know what water is and i understand when you say water in waves i know what clay is i know understand clay and pots i even understand dreams mind and dreams you know all the things in the dream and the mind produces them in the dream or appears as that that example also i understand but i don't understand brahman and the world because i see only one side of it the world where is brahman it's like somebody who is seeing ornaments but doesn't get what is gold so he says paripashyanti dhira very important each word is loaded here paripashyanti you have to see this how uh, shankaracharya says very beautifully he, he says he comments ah uh, um paripashyanti sarvata atmabhutam sarvasya aksharam pashyanti they see the imperishable you have to see the imperishable as the very essence as the very atman the reality of everything sarvata everywhere up and down and to your sides and to your front and your back inside in your mind in your thoughts and emotions in all beings whatever you see whoever you see whatever you are experiencing you have to find out the reality the re- that one reality everywhere as the atman the reality of everything just as what do you mean by atman help me out here the atman as just the gold is the atman of the ornament as clay is the atman of the pot what is the atman of all things so do you have to know clay or gold no those are examples even of clay and gold or even of everything in the universe what is the atman and slowly he will show us it is none other than being consciousness which is you and the startling answer will be you are the self of everything that you experience you means not you the person of course uh, so that is the um now the way to do it is to discern it when he says who will see it dhiraha so this word often comes in the upanishads this is the person who will succeed in realizing this shaunaka if you want to know really i told you the answer but if you really want to get it to realize this you have to be a dhira dhira in um, um in many many most indian languages this word is there in bengali for example it means a very patient and steady person and it's not very far from the the sanskrit meaning in sanskrit and especially in vedanta it means a fully qualified student so a person who has the fourfold qualifications viveka the discernment between eternal and non-eternal uh, vairagya a dispassion for the non-eternal the sixfold qualities um, the disciplines of the mind and then uh, intense desire for freedom this is a person fully competent this person with the teaching right teaching will become enlightened will find the imperishable will find the one thing by knowing which everything is not known will find the cause behind all effects what is the special method shankaracharya adds here who is this dhira vivekinah those who have the incisive this discernment this is very is a very loaded term this is the key to enlightenment see because gold is present in all ornaments so if you are seeing the ornaments you are literally seeing gold you just don't know it you don't understand what gold is if you um if you see all pottery and you say that i see pots and jars but where is the clay well then the answer will be you are seeing clay but you don't know what is clay yeah. so one of the scoldings we used to get from our teachers in traditional pandits would say your uh, uh, head is full of clay <laughs> clay headed uh, so you don't know what clay is then how would you know what is clay in all the pots how would you know what is gold in all the ornaments that is called discernment and the way to do that is to in our understanding isolate the reality from the name and form and function see the shape of the necklace is not gold the name necklace is not gold the fact that you put it around your neck that's not gold but quite apart from all of that the thing itself is gold similarly names and forms and functions here they are maya there's a network of maya but what what that network covers the reality of all things and yourself is brahman 
and then there will be methods which will take us to realize to help us discern but basically the the door to this realization is discernment viveka there's a very beautiful hymn to vivekananda anitya drishyeshu vivichya nityam tasmin samagatta ihasma leelaya viveka vairagya vishuddha chittam yosau viveki tamaham namami So it's a salutation to Vivekananda. The name Vivekananda is com- comes from Viveka. And what is this Viveka? The first verse um, is composed by uh, uh, Swami Ramakrishnananda Ji, one of the brother disciples of Vivekananda. In great reverence to his brother disciple Vivekananda, he composes this. He says, um, Anitya Drishyesho, in the midst of all perishable objects of experience, basically effects in the language of mundaka upanishad what we have been talking about all perishable things all around us vivichya nityam the, there is one imperishable underlying reality again the language of mundaka upanishad vivichya vivichya means it's a technical word which means ability to separate to extract not physically in our understanding just as it's not very difficult just as if i ask you to see all the ornaments in the shop and you say yeah i see them and if i say that now see gold you say yeah i see it it's a very immediate thing that you do in your minds that you see you understand what's gold there that is vivichya if i tell you look at the waves in the ocean the surf and the waves and the um, you know spray so yeah i see it then if i ask you now see water you say yeah in a blink of an eye you will say yeah i see water that's vivichya because you know both here we don't know the underlying reality and that's what makes it difficult and we're trying to know that but the process is exactly the same in an instant the enlightened one can say yeah i see everybody if you ask an enlightened one what do you see see he will say that i see whatever you are seeing i see people i see places i see the body i experience heat and cold all of that as you are seeing but aren't you seeing god he will instantly say yes of course everywhere all the time inside and outside if you are sick aren't you feeling uh, un, uh, you know unwell aren't you feeling um, pay, uh, pain and say yes i am but you are brahman beyond all sickness this is of course i am beyond all sickness and brahman instantly today we were reading uh, somebody asked swami shivananda mahapurush maharaj uh, he was very ill and his health was declining he was the president of the order and towards the end his health broke down completely so group of people had gathered around one early morning in his room he was especially sick so somebody asked him swami are you uh, how are you today how are you feeling the old swami he said if you are asking about the body it is not at all well it is deteriorating and going the way all things all perishable things go it will soon go away pass away if you are asking about me i am perfectly well i am and he says i am the atman i am perfectly well So this is the thing in an instant and he means both of it the next three mantras 7 8 and 9 in this chapter the first chapter uh, are adding some further refinement to this word bhuta yonim the source of all things because remember the original course question how can i know all things tell me one thing by which i can know all things and the answer was if you know the cause of all things then you know all things then what is the cause this is the cause so how is this the cause of all things this imperishable that is being uh, you know refined further in the next three mantras in what in what do you mean it's the cause of all things can you show me how it is the cause of all things um the next mantra is also famous yator nanabhi srijate grinhate cha yatha prithibhyam oshadhaya sambhavanti यथा सतः पुरुषात् केशलोमानि तथा क्षरात् संभवति ह विश्वम um the translation is these are examples to show um, what is meant with the source of all things as a spider spreads out and withdraws its its web as on the earth grows the herbs and trees and as from a living um, a human being issues out hair on the head and the body so out of the imperishable does the universe emerge here in this phenomenal creation all right so three examples have been given as the spider produces and retracts its web as um 
um, as from the earth, herbs and plants and trees grow, as from our bodies, you know, hair and, um, um, you know, Kesha Loma, we say hair in English, but in Sanskrit, the distinction is there. That which grows on the head is called Kesha, hair. And that which grows on the body is called Loma. But basically, same thing, hair comes from a living body. So the, from the imperishable Brahman, all things emerge, all the perishable things emerge. What he's doing here is using examples to help us. I watched this little, tiny little clip from, you know, Elon Musk. He says the, the, one of the secrets of his success is what he calls reasoning from first principles and not analogical thinking. So he says most, of, you know, when you teach something, when you try to understand something, analogies are very helpful. So like here, you know, like a spider, like from the earth, like from a living being. We are actually not talking about spiders or earth or hair coming out of a living body. We're talking about from Brahman, how the universe emerges. But look at what the Upanishad is doing. Upanishad is giving us a series of analogies. Like this, like this, like this. So Elon Musk said in that interview, that's very uh, analogical thinking is often used because it's very easy to teach. People can grasp it if you give some examples which they know already. If you already understand the example, you can get some idea of what is being said. It will never be exact. Then he made a distinction. He said, but if you want to do something original, you have to do for, uh, thinking ab initio, first prin uh, principle thing. I will not go into it. The first principle thinking is very difficult. Um, so you want to discover something, make an, a fundamental change. You have to understand the thing in itself without analogies or examples. So the difference in Vedanta would be, in Vedanta now, the, Upa, the rishis have done the first principle thinking for us. And now they're teaching us through the analogies because we can grasp it. But if you want to get an example of how you would do first principle thinking in, the, in Vedanta, a um, good example might be the Adhyasa Bhashya, which, which we just touched upon a few classes ago. So there are also examples there, but the attempt is not to explain something through analogies. Attempt is to go directly to our experience and try to reason it out. Anyway, and that's why it's so difficult. Here it is entirely through analogies. And um, it says, Just as a spider produces a web and retracts it. Now what's been said here? The spider is the material cause of the web and also the intelligent cause of the web. In Sanskrit, nimitta karana, upadana karana. What does that mean? See, when, say, a goldsmith makes ornaments out of gold, or a carpenter makes furniture out of wood, the material cause and the intelligent cause are different. The carpenter is the intelligent cause, and the wood is the material cause. The jeweler is the goldsmith is the intelligent cause, and the gold is the material cause. Um, but the spider's case, what does the spider produce? A web. So who is the intelligent being who produces the web? The spider, the sentient being, the little creature spider, is the intelligent being, the nimitta karana, who's producing a web. But with what material does the spider produce a web? The, the carpenter produces furniture with material which is not himself. Luckily, the carpenter doesn't become the furniture. <laughs> the carpenter takes wood and makes furniture, something separate from himself. But the spider produces its product, the web, from its own body. So the body of the spider is the material cause. And the intelligent being called spider is the uh, intelligent cause, nimitta karana. So in this spider are combined both the intelligent cause and the material cause. So it's a good example for Brahman. God is the creator of the universe. So intelligent cause of the universe. Who designed the universe? It's the old design theory. God designed the universe. Intelligent cause. But with what? With what material? There's no other material other than God. Brahman alone exists. So from Brahman itself. In Vedanta Sar we learned this. Abhinna nimitta upadana karana. The indistinguishable, the one and only uh, intelligent and material cause of the universe is Brahman. And yet here we are talking about Saguna Brahman or Ishwara. Brahman with the power of Maya. From the perspective of Brahman, Saguna Brahman, Ishwara. Ishwara or Saguna Brahman is the intelligent cause and Maya is the material cause. 
out of which the universe is made. Just like spider the being and spider the body of the spider as the material cause. So same spider. It produces the web from its body and it retracts it. Another good example, because we keep saying that the universe is produced by God and then it exists in God and then God can retract this universe again. It dissolves into God. Spider does that. I was uh, checking it out. Does the spider really retract its web? Well, yes, actually it does. Uh, if you check it out, it eats its web. <laughs> and it has glands which will transform the material, the proteins into it, into new web material. So it is true that here is an interesting creature which produces the web out of itself and then retracts means eats it and absorbs it back into itself and to again produce it later. A um, lot like the idea of the cycle of creation, existence, and dissolution. Shrishti sthiti pralaya in uh, Hinduism. To the spider example. Now, funny note to this, um, an old Indologist, one of the early Indologists, writes rather pompously, the ancient Hindus worshipped the spider. No, they didn't. There are, no, I mean, there are any kinds, many kinds of temples and deities, but there are no sp spider temples and deities. So, um, uh, so, no, it was just an example. If you see the Upanishad, Yatha Urnanavi Srijate Grinhatecha, the word Yatha means just like. It's an example, it's an analogy. And then a question may arise that, well, the spider puts on a lot of effort. So, does Brahman have to put in a lot of effort? God had to put in a lot of effort to make this universe? No. The next example says, just as um, as from the earth effortlessly em emerge herbs and plants and trees so uh, just like that from the imperishable emerges this universe effortlessly God makes this universe effortlessly another point is, is uh, um, illustrated here from the same earth a variety of products are produced so the web is of one type only but if you look at plants and herbs and trees, how many, what a wild profusion of life there is from the same earth. So from the same Brahman, this tremendous variety of the universe is produced and effortlessly. That's what the, the example goes to show. But then one might have a, a question here. Hey, this is exactly what the scientists are saying. From an insentient universe, you know, by Big Bang or something, from some quantum state, the universe emerges. So where is this Brahman? Because the earth is insentient and from that, you know, living beings are emerging. So to correct that, immediately another example is given. Yatha sata purushat ke shalomani. No, it's exactly the opposite. As from a living body, hair and nails, which are dead, and they are emerging. So our hair and nails are actually dead cells. So they are emerging uh, from a living body. Similarly, from a sentient, from Brahman, which is consciousness, a non-conscious universe emerges. From Brahman, which is one, the many emerge. Bra Brahman, which is unlimited, the limited are emerging. Brahman, which is imperishable, the perishable are emerging. Just opposite in nature. And Brahman is, uh, is uh, conscious, is limitless, is immortal. And the products are not conscious. And they are limited. And they are mortal. In every aspect, they are different from the cause. Um, so, yeah. These three very nice examples, just like this, it says, it's not about plants and trees and the earth. It's not about human beings and hair and barber shops and all. It's not about, uh, not even about uh, spiders and webs. Just like that, from the imperishable uh, emerges this phenomenal universe. Emerges, exists and disappears back again and again emerges. All right. We'll stop here, look at the comments, and then let me bring it to a close. Rick says, some physicists argue that unified field sought by physics and consciousness, Brahman, are one and the same, since there couldn't be two ultimate realities. They couldn't be. But then the unified, what the Advaiti would say is that the unified field theory, the unified field um, is um, not the ultimate reality. It's still a subset. Because if you cannot integrate consciousness into it, then there is something left over for explaining. If you can, then only uh, you can claim that. See, ultimately from our perspective, 
the non duality would include us would not exclude us and it would see it would be a non duality of the universe not apart from you the universe as your appearance so that must must happen otherwise still this limitation sri ram says swami ji we cannot do anything to attain brahman means all sadhana is perfunctory no it is a purpose all spiritual per- practice is not necessary no it has a great purpose if you don't do that we'll never attain so it's like um um you know you have to set sail you have to raise your sail the wind is blowing but unless we raise the sail we unless we do our part we will not catch that wind the wind of grace god always wants us to become enlightened and god realized so that opportunity is always open to us but we must take a look we must do that discernment we must put in our we must want it the upanishad say uh, who will realize the atman and the upanishad says that to whomever the atman reveals itself tasya is abhivrunute tanum swam the atman reveals itself that one will realize the atman but to whom will the atman reveal itself and shankara claims uh, shankara comments there whoever chooses the atman that one the atman chooses upanishad says whomever the atman chooses to that one the atman reveals itself but we want to know whom will it choose will it choose me and shankara says yes whom will it choose the one who chooses the atman if you want to realize god knock and it shall be opened and ask and you shall receive so you have to choose and then you will get it that choosing is sadhana the choosing is the spiritual practice um but you are right it is a purpose to remove obstacles so sadhana has a negative purpose you are looking at pottery and saying that claiming that you're not seeing clay you're looking at all the waves and you're claiming that you're not seeing what is water so that obstacle that ignorance that block has to be removed that's all and spiritual practices for that ramya says uh, if brahman is not the knower why do we use pramata does this indicate a combination of brahman plus mind correct so brahman is not a pramata ultimately is neither prameya in fact that's a good point you have raised all this when we said yatta adrishyam agrahyam alakshanam adrishyam agrahyam agotram um, avarnam achakshu srotram tadapani padam that line it means brahman is neither prameya not pramata that's good you raised this point it's these words are very powerful in sanskrit and they encompass a lot prameya and pramata means pramata means the knower a seer hearer smeller taster the one who knows the epistemic subject and prama prameya means the object of knowledge so brahman is not an object of knowledge and is not a subject of knowledge also is not the knower however very important the knower and the known are not apart from brahman See, this is the point i was trying to make in my purnam lecture see the reality is just this does brahman exclude the knower and the known no 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 brahman excludes nothing this world which we are inhabiting right now this is brahman all of it but um we don't know the underlying reality it's like saying oh i have understood what gold is gold is not necklace and um, you know uh, or a bracelet or a ring all right you're correct that's an understanding but in that case is the necklace bracelet and ring something other than gold no 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 when you say gold it encompasses every possible golden ornament so when you say brahman pure consciousness it is not a knower not an object of knowledge not a pramata not a prameya however all knowers and all objects of knowledge are nothing but brahman if you get that you will get get advaita one great advaita master said beautifully do viruddh baat jab ek saath samajh mein pakad mein aayegi tab advait pakad mein aayega when you understand two contradictory things at once you grasp it farther than the farthest nearer than the nearest it does not move yet it it's faster than the fastest if you can grasp it at once what is meant there was something very precise is meant there then you get advaita how is it that it is not the knower and not an object of knowledge and yet all knowers and all objects of knowledge are nothing apart from you the consciousness 
It's like sunlight and moonlight. The moon, sunlight is not moonlight. But the moonlight is nothing but sunlight. There can be no moonlight without, being sun, without sunlight. But sunlight doesn't have to be moonlight. Even without the moon, the sunlight can exist. You are the Atman, Brahman, the sunlight. And what you see through the mind and senses is like the moonlight. It cannot work and exist without you. But you can exist entirely without the mind and the senses. Vishwanath says the same people also thought that Ajya means goat. In ancient Hindus worshipped it. Yes, Ajya means the unborn, but also means goat. So did the ancient Hindus. Uh, yeah. There's a little more to it, but anyway, the point is taken. Rick says, with the physicist, I'm referring to argue that the unified field is consciousness. Ah, yes. So that is another thing. That's uh, a deeper understanding. of. It's very interesting that when you're going to the fundamental reality of the universe, how does consciousness figure that? It's a very strange thing. If you think about it, if I say right now that um, we are looking for the fundamental reality of the universe, where did the universe or uh, originate? What was there in the initial state of the universe? And I say to you, uh, that uh, uh, the pen, of course, is very key to the fundamental reality of the universe. You'll see how ridiculous is that? Universe comes from some quantum state, there's a big bang, and then uh, all the particles uh, are produced, and then the stars, um, you know, evolve, and the galaxies come, and then the world, uh, you know, arises in this solar system, and then after millions and millions of years, um, uh, very basic life evolves in the oceans and then it evolves out into the land and through millions of years of evolution human beings evolve and then the human beings evolve uh, uh, in industrial civilization and now they produce this pen how could this be at the beginning of the universe that's crazy but when you say consciousness is somehow fundamental to the universe you're saying something like that because the general idea, idea of consciousness is what um, the universe was produced no consciousness Stars came into being, no consciousness. Planets came into being, there's no consciousness. Um, then, the, you know, life evolved in the, maybe there's consciousness or not, but, you know, earlier people would have said that basic life has no consciousness at all. And then finally, higher beings evolved with evolved nervous system and brain, and consciousness came up as an epiphenomenon. How can consciousness be at the fundamental level of the universe? And yet, now, when you are investigating science as advanced enough, cosmology, Particle physics has advanced enough to that level where now you cannot do this without uh, involving consciousness or the observer in some way. It's very interesting. Why does consciousness suddenly figure in the discussion of it should figure in brain science, in the life sciences at most, but not in at the fundamental level of the universe. And yet consciousness figures there. I remember seeing this amazing lecture by. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, Sir Roger Penrose in Calcutta, the British Council organized it. So he was using this uh, OHP, overhead transparencies, and he drew a triangle, I remember. And the triangle was mind, mathematics, universe. What? This is, he said, this is the great mystery. How is it a physical universe, mind, and a product of mind, the mathematics, how this mathematics can understand the physical universe so well? What is the link? We are minds. We do mathematics. And this mathematics can understand the vast universe. Whether they can, such powerful things, you can predict the basic structure of the universe, what's happening in the world. So that's the mystery. Um, Shravani says the spider example is referring to Karya Brahman. Um, Karana Brahman and Karya Brahman. So Karana Brahman is the causal Brahman, which is Saguna Brahman which is the spider. And the web is Karya Brahman, which is the universe. Um, so, yeah, Karya Brahman in the sense that the universe is produced from the cause, which is um, Saguna Brahman or Ishvara. But it will come later. When you say Brahman transits the universe, that mantra we did now, that one, that one talks about the ultimate reality. Brahman without any qualifications, Brahman without Maya, just, just Brahman itself. Then it makes a, a transition. Yad Bhuta Yonim, it is the source of the universe. So Brahman by itself has nothing to do with the universe. But the universe has to be attributed to Brahman because the universe cannot exist without Brahman. When you attribute the universe to Brahman, 
then it becomes the conditioned Brahman. So yes, uh, it really the original ultimate reality is Nirguna Brahman, but that they will come to. They will ultimately refine that understanding. But right now, he's going towards the concept of Saguna Brahman, which produces the universe. Because remember, the, the question was, what is that one thing by knowing which everything is known? So by knowing the cause, you know all the effects. And so by knowing Brahman, you know the effects of Brahman. If you have effects of Brahman and Brahman is the cause, what Brahman are we talking about? What is the nature of Brahman we're talking about? Saguna Brahman, Ishwara. However, Saguna Brahman also cannot be understood without knowing what is Nirguna Brahman. So Nirguna Brahman, you have to start there or at least end up there. So right now, this talk of cause and effect, but actually Brahman transcends cause and effect. But one way of understanding Brahman is through this question. Uh, of uh, Shaunaka. What is the cause? Amir Hussain says, in reference to qualification student, student does not have dispassion quite yet from the all that is non-eternal. Can she still benefit from these teachings? Yes, it can, but it will take a longer time. Uh, we'll have to struggle through this and develop the requisite dispassion. Let me just read out what Vivekananda says. You'll see what stunning kind of qualification he wants, you know, what kind of, what level of dispassion he wants from the uh, student. It's in volume three of complete works of Vivekananda. This is one of the examples of how much uh, dispassion vairagya is, is necessary. W one existence appearing as many. Towards the end of this talk, he says, uh, this is the lecture, one existence appearing as many. Vivekananda says, this is the method of the Advaita Jnani. The truth has to be heard, then reflected upon, and then to be constantly asserted, that is meditated upon. Think always, I am Brahman. The point I want to read out is in the earlier lecture, the free soul, the free soul. There, at the end of that talk, the free soul, just before this um, lecture, one existence appearing as many. Who are fit to become Jnana Yogis? This is the question which Amir was asking. Who are fit to become Jnana Yogis? Those who are equipped with these requisites. Vairagya, dispassion. He says, first, renunciation. And then he talks about renunciation. Look in what sublime and fiery language. Renunciation of all fruits of work, karma. And of all enjoyments in this life or another life. If you are the creator of this universe... Whatever you desire, you will have. Look at this. What, what insight. If you are the creator of this universe, whatever you desire, you will have. Because you will create it for yourself. It is only a question of time. Some get it immediately. While others, the past samskaras, impressions, stand in the way of getting their desires. We give first place to desires for enjoyment, either in this life or another life. So that's what we are trying to do. Get these enjoyments. He says, stop that. Deny that there is any life at all. Look, look what height he takes it to. Deny that there is any life at all. Because life is only another name for death. Deny that you are a living being. <laughs> Who cares for life? Vivekananda says. Life is one of those hallucinations. And death is its counterpart. It sounds brutal, but it must be logically true. If you are Brahman, these are once you realize you are Brahman, life and death will be hallucinations to you. And within hallucinations, the chase for this pleasure or that pleasure is further madness. Stop it all. That is Vairagya. Who cares for life? Life is one of those hallucinations and death is its counterpart. Joy is one part of those hallucinations and misery the other part and so on. What have you to do with life or death. This is our most important cons concern, you know, life or death. These are all creations of the mind. This is called giving up desires for enjoyment either in this life or another. Vairagya. <laughs> Something to think about. If somebody thinks about it and achieves even a part of this Vairagya, enlightenment and freedom is is. You're just one step away from it. You're on the very doorstep of enlightenment and moksha and freedom. The really, the problem is not in understanding Advaita Vedanta. The problem is in this Vairagya and the, and the 
six fold treasure. That's where the problem is. Vivekananda says, I know where the shoe pinches. It's not in our study or understanding, it's there. Sri says, Are there souls who will never be liberated due to lack of self effort? Eventually, all will choose liberation at some point and will become liberated. Priya says, Does uh, how free will? Uh, a choice every moment to choose God, unselfishness over world desires. Correct. Upanishad will say, at every moment you are presented with this choice. Make a choice. If you truly, truly make a choice, at that moment also it, you can be liberated. Charles says from Singapore, consciousness is individual. Consciousness needs a reference and relationship from our understanding. Consciousness limited by language, vocabulary to understand and appreciate consciousness. Silence is perhaps best to achieve our association with consciousness. Which part in Hinduism investigates this deeper, please? This deeper is the, what we are reading right now. The language, the closest you can get is the language of the Upanishads. The language of Advaita Vedanta. And then it also says, silence is a higher language. Rushal says, I would like to read reading Swami Vivekananda. Where would you ask, advise me to start? Four yogas. Four yogas of Swami Vivekananda. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Arpanamastu